Hello, and welcome to this video, which I'm calling Unlocking Latin, Transform Your Study. The idea here is to take some ideas from the Latin boot camps that I offer and present them to you in condensed form, um, A, just to be an aid to you as you continue with your study of Latin, but also to give you a little taste of what's going to happen in the boot camps so that you can decide if you want to go deeper into this. So as you're listening to this video, if you feel that and this is really helpful stuff, I would like to dive deeper into the types of things he's talking about, then just know that you could sign up for uh, the Latin boot camps and pursue any of these things further. And the links for the boot camps will be below this video in the description. So there are three levels of Latin boot camp. And what I want to do is take one little piece of what each one of them does and present a small bit of that to you here, which I think would be helpful for anyone's Latin study, whatever your age, whatever your level, um, these things should be helpful. Um, and I'd also love to hear from you uh, and your comments about whether or not this was helpful to you. So feel free to shoot us an email at academics at judiusjohnson.com and uh, let us know what you thought. So the first thing I want to talk about um, is the fact that languages have a fundamental need to say stuff. It's actually what languages are for. They're created for the purpose of saying stuff. So um, there's this whole going theory about how language came about that um, essentially tries to apply in sort of an evolutionary model to languages. And so you think, well, originally what happened was you had these cavemen and they were walking around and they didn't have any language. And so they would communicate by grunting and gesturing and this sort of thing. And so eventually some of those grunts turned into uh, verbs, right? As in go, stop, eat, whatever. And then as they began to link together that grunt with another grunt indicating another object, then you got objects and you got verbs, and it sort of built its way up in this massive system of grammar that we um, know today. Um, it's kind of an interesting theory. What's funny about it is that we don't see any evidence of that in the uh, linguistic record. For as long as we have evidence of languages, we see a universal tendency downward. That is a tendency towards less complexity, grammatically speaking. Languages may get more complex in terms of all the exceptions that make them difficult to use. English is famous for this, but that's actually the grammatical system breaking down. And so English hasn't gotten more grammatically complicated than the parent language. It's actually been getting less complicated, and that's what creates the difficulties for the, um, for the non-native speaker learning the language. How do I know when how to handle all these exceptions and things? Um, well, whatever, whatever the case is there, we can see in the linguistic record this, um, these two principles at work that our ancestors are having to struggle with. On the one hand, there's the uh, need for accuracy, and on the other hand, there's the need for ease in speaking. Accuracy is obtained through greater complexity. The more forms you have, the more likely you are to have the one specific form you need for the thing you're trying to say. But ease pushes back against this. It's hard to use a language that has lots and lots of forms in it. This is what's led a lot of people to say that you can't speak Latin. It's got too much morphology. It's got too much going on. It's not possible to speak it. it makes a lot of sense, except that it was spoken for a very long time, and a lot of us do speak it. Not the point. Uh, over time, what we do with all these forms is we stop using the ones that we don't need. So there's a kind of a simplification that comes from getting rid of the difficult forms that are just hard to use or that we don't use that often. So language development then is a back and forth between the need to be more accurate on the one hand and the need for speaking to be easy on the other hand. This is a couple of consequences for how we think about Latin. On the one hand, it does explain why Latin is so complicated. Every place where Latin is more complicated than English um, for example, the number of verb forms, the number of noun forms, the number of words for killing somebody. All of these are places where Latin is going after a greater degree of precision than English typically goes in for, right? English, it's good enough to know you killed the guy in Latin. How'd you do it, right? Did you, did you cut his head off? Did you line him up with 10 other guys and kill every 10th guy? That, that's a cool, that's one of my favorites. But that being the case, it's also true that the Romans weren't exempt for the desire for ease of use. It's important to remember that there's really three major things that Romans were for the formative years of their history. They were farmers, they were warriors, and they were engineers, almost in that order. Um, and so if you look at Latin in comparison to Greek, you'll see that the Romans actually removed a lot of grammar that was there before uh, in an attempt to make the language more handy and more useful. 
And so that means that there are shortcuts, habits, and cheats to be found in Latin, not shortcuts that we can put on after the fact, but shortcuts the Romans themselves took to get to meaning quicker without having to go through as much of the morphology and whatnot, syntactical nonsense. It also means that all of this massive grammatical apparatus that we find in Latin is to be viewed as facilitating rather than hindering communication. That's a big part of the shift I'd like to make in your thinking is that the forms of Latin make communication easier, not harder. And so here's an exercise to illustrate this. Just a couple of silly examples. My enemy attacked me with soldiers in English. Okay, is the enemy accompanied by soldiers who are also attacking? So we look down the walls and there's your enemy and there's some soldiers around with him. Or is your enemy attacking by means of soldiers, perhaps while standing at a safe distance like the coward that he is? Another example, the children are seeking pets. Does that mean the children are out looking for pets? Or does that mean that the children are pets who do this sort of activity that we call seeking? They're seeking pets. Um, it's not clear in English which of those is true. Um, one of them may be more likely than the other, but that's only given a certain type of speaking situation. You can imagine a story where the other becomes more likely. Uh, the, those distinctions would be clear in Latin because they have the additional grammatical apparatus to make those things clear. In English, they're ambiguous, ambiguous and we have to disambiguate them by context. Okay, so um, that's about um, the um, need that Latin has to say things. But that's okay. We can all accept that Latin's got to say things, right? Great. How do you say stuff? How do you go about saying stuff in a language? It's normal, especially for an English speaker, to think of semantics when we think about how languages communicate. That is to say, we think about vocabulary words. After all, isn't a sentence, which is a thought, just the combination of the meanings of all the words that make up that sentence? No, it's absolutely not. Consider these sentences in English. Jane gave Jim the ball. Jim gave Jane the ball. Jim gave the ball Jane. The ball gave Jim Jane. No, the sum total of the meanings is the same in all of these sentences. It's the same words being used over and over again, and so the semantic addition brings you to the same total meaning every time. But they're obviously very different sentences. They mean very different things. So then what is it that does determine the meaning? You might want to say, well, it's the word order. It's the fact that Jim comes before Jane or after Jane or whatever that does it. But that's also wrong. The word order doesn't determine the meanings. The syntactical relationships between the words determines the meaning. The word order is just how we know which word stands in which relationship to another. Oh, that one came first. That one's the subject. But it's the fact that it's the subject, not the fact that it's first, that actually determines the meaning. So when it comes to making meaning in languages, while the definitions of words certainly matter, much more important are the relationships those words are put in and relation, put into each other. Relationships depend on something about the thing related and something outside of the thing related. So consider two cars, my car and another car that looks just like my car. We can say that my car is similar to that other car in color. Now, both the two things have to be necessary in order for that to be true. On the one hand, my car is gray. And so there's something about my car that's true that makes it like this other car. The other thing is the other car is gray. If it weren't gray, it doesn't matter that my car is gray, they wouldn't be of a similar color. That similarity in color depends upon each of them being gray. Well, likewise, in making meaning through relationships and language, words bring some content with them. And that's like the inherent color of my car, the grayness of my car and they find other content elsewhere in the sentence. And that's like the other car being gray. The inherent content is determined by the form. And we call it the consideration of these forms, such as the case of the noun, the person number tense moving voice of a verb, uh, all of that stuff, we call that morphology. The outside content is determined by structures in the sentence, such as subordinate clauses, prepositional phrases, etc., And we call that syntax. And so in language, meaning is made by the conjunction of morphology and syntax, and grammar is the combined study of those two elements. This then is why we're memorizing so many forms and learning about things like the ablative of means. These are the ways that Latin goes about showing us the relationships between words and constructing meaning.
Okay, so that's a little bit of what the type of thing we'll do in Latin Bootcamp 1, which is focused on digging deeper into languages as systems of communication, how they work with special focus on Latin. We're going to change turn now to uh, Bootcamp 2, which now goes to look at a um, closer look at the comparative and historical grammar of Latin, thinking specifically about the um, system of cases and the verbal system, helping students to recognize both where these forms come from, that they make sense, and how they get used in a more robust way than is often given in the, the typical Latin classroom. So the first question here is why are there cases, right? There are, there are these basic parts of speech, verb, adverb, noun, adjective. There's more than that, but those are the most important. Why are these the most important? Because these are the most basic slots in a sentence. You have to have a verb, and if we're going to know anything about that verb at all, you need a subject and maybe an object, right? Maybe some adjectives to modify that subject. You can modify the verb further with adverbs. This is the basic stuff. The verb is the king, right? As an analogy, I always use this with my students, and that is the analogy of a party. So imagine that the verb is throwing a party, and the verb sends out some invitations. And so the verb is going to invite two different types of people. The verb is going to invite some nouns, and the verb is going to invite some adverbs to the sentence, the party. So then the adverbs get the invitation, they think this is great, and they put it on their calendar, and they're ready to show up. The nouns get the sentence, and they think, oh man, this is awesome, um, let me call verb. So they call them up, and they say, hey verb, uh, noun here, got your invitation, looks great, can't wait. Quick question, would you mind if I brought a couple of friends along with me? And the verb says, absolutely not, the more the merrier, bring them along. So the noun then hangs up with verb, and then checks his contacts and calls an adjective. And says, hey, adjective, guess what? Verbs throw at a party, and I want you to come with me. And the adjective says, that's awesome. His parties are so great. Quick question, would you mind if I brought a couple of my friends along with me too? To which the noun replies, no. I mean, verbs said the more the merrier, so I, it should be fine. So they have the party. The noun shows up with adjectives, and the adjectives show up with their adverb buddies, and the verb sees all of this, and the verb is like, this is great. Now it's a party, right? Everybody at the party is there because of the verb, because of an invitation that began with the verb. Some people received a direct invitation, some people received an indirect invitation, but at the end of the day, everyone is there because of a particular relationship to the verb, and everyone's got to account if someone starts to go through and says, do you really belong here? Uh, who do you know? How are you here? That chain of who do you know has got to get back to the verb at some point. Okay, so each of these four basic parts of speech are so fundamental to meaning that they name not just a class of words, these are nouns, these are adjectives and whatnot, but also a function within the sentence. That is to say, a verb can be modified by an adverb or by something that isn't an adverb, but is acting like an adverb. When we say that that thing is an adverbial, it's acting adverbially. Its subject may be a noun or something acting like a noun, a nominal. Here's an example. Running is hard. Running isn't a noun. It's a verb used like a noun. Same thing when I say I hate running. But you can also use a verb like an adjective. The running dog is white. Running dog. Sometimes you can even use a verb like an adverb. How did it go? It went swimmingly. So let's go back to cases. Remember that cases only apply to nouns and adjectives. Okay, now forget that because that's totally wrong. They don't apply to nouns and adjectives, they apply to nominals and adjectivals. So in the sentence running is hard, running is in the nominative case. You can put it into other cases. You can say, I hate running, the accusative. I got here by running, ablative. I am tired of running, genitive. And I came for running, dative. Okay, so if that's true, what is it the cases really do then? What have we learned? Cases show relationships to other words in a sentence. The nominative shows that a word has a certain relationship to the verb. It's the subject of the verb or it's the predicate nominative. The genitive shows that a word has a relationship to another noun, possession, right? This is the dog of my sister. Which dog? The one of my sister. Cases are ways of taking a nominal or adjectival and using them to modify another noun or verb. Using cases, you can make a noun into an adjectival, in the genitive or dative, 
or adverbial, nominative, accusative, dative, ablative. English does the same thing through word order and prepositions. Latin's way isn't better, but it does have some distinct advantages and also some disadvantages. Okay, so that makes sense. That, that helps to understand what's the deal with cases, why do we have cases, etc. So here's the next question, and this is the one that's really burning if you're a student of Latin who's trying to get all this memorization done. Why are there declensions then? Right? I mean, these groupings of noun and adjective endings, um, they're going to cause you a great deal of grief if they haven't so far. Uh, and I remember trying to memorize the third declension. It took me an embarrassingly long time. Um, and at one level, you know, it's just memorization. So, okay, just to go memorize it. But it's also more than that because it creates confusion, especially because some of the forms get used more than once, both within a declension and across declensions. And at one level, let's be honest, that just feels lame. Right. If you're going to bother making a whole bunch of forms that have to be learned, why not go all the way and make enough forms so that you don't have to repeat any forms? It's like they decided to make the language super hard and then got too lazy to finish the job and kind of stop halfway through. Okay, the problem with that is that's assuming that declensions belong to the part of Latin that is trying to make more forms in order to be more precise. But it doesn't. Actually, declensions belong to the part of Latin that is trying to make things easier. Okay, you want me to explain that one, right? Because you're thinking, mm, I don't see it. The declensions were not intended. No one decided, hey, let's have a bunch of declensions. Like, I don't know, how about five? That sounds great. Actually, what they thought was, let's have one set of endings we use for everything. So, like, everything nominative will get the same ending. And then everything genitive will get the same ending. And we can add a different ending if we want to make things plural, but it'll be the same ending in every instance. And that way, we only have to know one set of endings and things will be a lot easier. That sounds great. So why isn't that what we have? Why isn't that what I'm being asked to memorize? What gives? Well, it turns out that when you look at the stems of words, which are what you have to have to make meaning, right? They don't all end with the same letter. So when you add additional letters to the end of the word, when you put endings on words, you don't always wind up with the same thing. So let's assume that the ending for the accusative singular is, I don't know, M. Oh, wait, it is. So let's put it on colonus, and we're going to wind up with colonum. But if you put it on puella, you're not going to get puellum, you're going to get puellum. And if you add it on rex, whose stem is rec, you're going to get recum which is hard to say, and so it's going to kind of turn into regim. The declensions are what happens when you apply one set of endings to words with different stem endings. Every word that ends in A will come out the same, and so they form a group, and we call that group first declension. Every word ending in O will come out the same, and that's, a, that's the second declension. Words ending in consonants won't all come out the same, but they're all going to have similar problems. And that's what we call the third declension. And that's why the third declension is so much harder for students to learn because you've got a variety of problems and not just one single set of problems that are at, at work there. Okay. That's the type of stuff, the type of conversations we'll have in boot camp two. Turning to Latin boot camp three, we're going to start to look at the structure of Latin sentences. Uh, that is to say, if we've been doing a lot of work in morphology in boot camp two, we're now turning more to syntax in boot camp three. And this is really kind of an interesting point because students are very often taught that word order doesn't matter in Latin. And this is false, but it is trying to express something true. I think a more helpful way to express what that utterance is trying to say that would be true to the truth of the matter is to say that word order doesn't do in Latin what word order does in English. But it does a lot of important work. Word order doesn't generally tell you the function of a noun, for example, but it does often tell you which noun and adjective is modified. What I want to quickly point out here is something that was the biggest game changer in my ability to read Latin sentences quickly and accurately without having to go back and rework them over and over again until I got them right. And the thing I want to tell you arises out of word order. right? And this is that's the real transformation we're all trying to get to. If you've got to work every Latin sentence with the kind of detail you use when you're doing your homework to know what it means, then you're never going to be able to pick a book like one of these big blue, blue books here, which are all in Latin, and just read through them. Because that's you, you're going to spend an hour on every sentence, and it's not going to work. 
you need to be able to pick it up and not work the sentences, but just read the sentences and save the working for the really, really hard ones. The thing that really got me to that point, this thing that really elevated and transformed my own ability to read Latin comes directly out of word order in Latin. So let's talk for about the word order Latin prefers to use. English prefers subject, verb, object. Latin prefers subject, object, verb. The intuition the Latin, Latin speakers were working with is that the most important information should be held to the end of the sentence. And so Latin in building sentences likes to build suspense, right? Um, it's as if you were to say, um, so I was going to the store the other day and on the way to the store, this incredible thing, I mean, an amazing thing. You've never seen such a thing. The lines, the smooth character of it, the way that it just glided through the air. There was, there's never been a thing quite like this thing, which I saw. I hadn't expected to see such a thing. What a thing was this frisbee, or whatever it happens to be, right? But it's all building up towards, you don't really know what's going on until you get to the last word of the sentence. And once you hear it, you've got to go back and think through everything else and then make your judgments of, uh, I think he's overselling it a little bit. And this is true not just for main clauses in Latin, it's also true for subordinate clauses. And so the last word in a well-written Latin sentence is usually the verb. Here's some examples. Rex Mariam matrimoniam duxit, right? The king led Mary into marriage. Duxit, led, is the last word of the sentence. Or again, Marcus, quid amica meum est, me amat. Marcus, who is my friend, loves me. We don't get to know what it is that Marcus does until the very end, Amat. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's not just clauses that will follow this principle. It's also true for things that imitate clauses. Prepositional phrases, participial phrases, noun phrases. So here are some examples. You might say, Maria in these currens don't I date it. The participle currens is acting like a verb in the participial phrase, Maria in these currens. And so, that is going to come at the end because it's like the verb will be like Mary running into the streets. Or omnia dona in illuminatas huius urbis vias a poeta yactasus. All the gifts are thrown by the poet into the illuminated streets of this city. In illuminatas huius urbis vias. This prepositional phrase, the preposition begins it, and the most important word in the phrase, what we're getting to is the noun that's the object of that preposition, which is vias. And then everything else comes within the middle of that. Or finally, totius hurius patriae regina domum nostrum cross venia. Totius hurius patriae regina domum nostrum cross venia. The queen of this whole country will come to our house tomorrow. Um, the subject of the sentence is the queen of the whole country. So the genitive tends to go out in front. Totius hurius urbis regina because we're saving that noun that's the, really the subject proper until the very end of that noun clause that is the subject of the verb thing. So then we wind up with this principle. A clause or phrase typically begins with a word that signals its initiation. The subject of a main clause, a subordinating conjunction for a subordinate clause, a preposition for a prepositional phrase, etc., and will terminate with the verb or verb-like thing for that clause or phrase. Thus, you wind up with something like an open bracket at the beginning and a closed bracket at the end. And when you come to a Latin sentence, you can actually create these brackets as you read to break the sentence down to a group of smaller sentences, right? This is really huge because essentially what you're doing when you do this is you're diagramming the sentence. But unlike English diagramming, which requires you to step out of the text and rewrite the entire sentence in a visual way that is very effective at showing the relationships between the words, but has no relationship to how it comes on the page or the order that it comes on the page, right? And so you can't diagram meaning the sentences while you're reading, unless you're some sort of truly remarkable grammar freak, because the distance between the sentence on the page and the sentence as diagrammed is too great. But because of the word order in Latin, it is possible to bracket phrases and clauses as you read without having to rewrite them 
And so you're doing the same thing sentence diagramming does, which is seeing the relationships, making visible and perspicuous to yourself the relationships among the words in the sentence without having to rewrite the sentence. And so in addition to it being something you can use to mark up a sentence when you're really having trouble with it, it can just become the way that you read. So that as you're reading, you're noticing these things. And the advantage of this is that every really massive sentence, the kind that go on for 10 or 15 or 20 lines, is made up of a smaller number of clauses that are themselves much, much smaller and much, much easier to translate. Um, and so rather than trying to read this whole massive thing and do all this stuff, you can break it down into smaller sentences, see what's going on with those, put those in relationship to each other, and then build out the meaning of the thing that way. And you can come to be able to do this while you're reading a text at normal sight reading speeds. And when you can do that, then Latin becomes a lot more fun and a lot easier to manage. So that's a little bit of a taste of what we're going to do across the different Latin boot camps. Again, Latin boot camp one, talking about language in general, how communication works in language with a particular eye to the ways that Latin goes about trying to solve particular communication challenges and problems. Boot camp two, looking at the morphological system, considering both how the forms themselves come about, but also how the cases and the tenses and moods of the verbs and things, how they mean. Why do we have these cases? Why do we have these moods? or whatever else. And then Latin Bootcamp 3, looking at translation and sentence structure, trying to recognize the syntactical structures of the sentence in order to facilitate and motivate really good, really accurate, and really fast translation. All of this is done through games and activities that keep the boot camps really fun for kids so they stay engaged, gives them a chance to interact with one another, to bring their own intuitions and thoughts into play, and to just laugh and have fun together because learning proceeds better when we're having fun. So again, if you're interested in the boot camps for your children, please check out the link below. Go to the page on boot camps. And if you have any further questions, please do contact me at academics at juniorsjohnson.com. I hope you found this helpful and informative. I hope this will help you to begin to move forward in a more um, competent way in your Latin study. And I hope to see you in one of our other Latin programs in the future. Thank you.